Um, hopefully you can hear me. Oh my gosh, UPS just showed up, so apologies for my dog. Um, my name is Sandy. I'm the senior editor at Bold Strokes Books, and this is our first ever bookathon. So thank you all for coming. We so appreciate it. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of features of Zoom, just so you're all aware. Um, at the top right-hand corner of your screen, there is an icon that has um, a bunch of little boxes that says gallery view. That is going to be the best um, way for you to see all our panelists. And at the bottom, in the middle, there's um, an icon that says Q&A. And that is where you post all your questions. So please feel free to use the chat roll um, for chatting and commentary. But if you would like to ask the panelists questions, please use the Q&A. Okay, I am now going to pass it over to the infamous Carson Tate to moderate this panel. Infamous. Infamous. Hi, everyone. My name is Carson Tate, and I see that we have over 100 attendees. Thanks, y'all, for tuning in. i um, excited to moderate this panel of awesome authors. We have, um, I'm just going to call out your names if you just wave. Um, that'd be great. We have Aaron Dutton. And <laughs> um, we have Radcliffe. That's <laughs> We have Renee Roman, Emily Smith, and Erin McKenzie. So I'm going to start back at Erin. Um, and Erin, why don't you tell us what your um, upcoming release is? And um, if you've got a picture, show it to us and tell us a little bit about what's what. Um, your experiences with this panel topic, Medical Romance First Responder. Uh, sure. Um, so my next book is coming out in June, and I don't have the book yet, but I do have a picture of the cover. Um, is that backwards on your screen? It's backwards on my yeah. No, it's okay. good. Okay, good. Um, it's called Three Alarm Response, and it's a three novella collection. Um, one, the first story features a firefighter, the second story features a police officer, and the third story features a, a pair of paramedics. Um, and they're all kind of tied together uh, as a, as a um, kind of a support group for each other, you know, as colleagues. And also, um, it's a story of how they each find romance in the middle of the actions of their jobs. So, and it's, um, I've written several first responders books about police officers and firefighters before. So, I really enjoy writing in that um, topic. Excellent. Um, Renee, tell us about yes. your upcoming book. I, I have, um, it's kind of hard to see, uh, it's Bonded Love, and it is about a master carpenter who gets into, her name is um, Blaze Carter, and uh, she gets into a motorcycle accident and meets her um, soon-to-be interest of um, falling in love, maybe. Um, her name is Trinity and she's a nurse in the ER and, um, it's, um, it's a fun story. I had a blast writing it and it comes out in June. Excellent. Lots to look forward to in June. Emily, tell us about your latest. Well, I just now two seconds ago pulled this cover up on my phone. So if you can see it, it may be backwards. Is it backwards? No. no, no, okay, excellent, good. Um, so my upcoming book is uh, called First Do No Harm and it's coming out, I believe July, but everyone says June for theirs, so maybe I'm off by a month. Um, but I'm really excited about this story. It's my favorite uh, book that I've, I've written so far. Um, it's about uh, an emergency medicine resident uh, who meets an ERPA that works together. Um, and obviously they, uh, they you know, may or may not fall in love, which of course, you know, is predictable, but um, the Cassidy uh, Sullivan is the uh, ER resident and she has kind of a tainted past um, and it proves to be uh, quite uh, conflicting for, for the two of them. So it's sort of their uh, story working through that. And you see some characters from my last book um, from All of Me uh, that make 
appearances in this again. So it's sort of tied together, although not really a sequel. That's fun. I like that. All right, Aaron McKenzie, tell us tell us about your um, latest. But didn't it just come out? Like, uh, it's about to May first. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, excellent. I can. Yep. <clears throat> so you can. Okay. So here's. Uh, can you see the cover there? Absolutely. So actually, a book. <laughs> so it's called While My Heart Beats. Um, mine goes way back in history. Um, I wanted to write an, an historical. I really love history and wanted to try my hand at an historical novel. And uh, I decided to write about nurses and voluntary aid detachment workers in World War I. So our, the two main characters that come together are from different countries and different classes, um, but they are kind of thrown together in a general hospital in France during the war. And we take it from there. I loved writing this story. I went down a lot of rabbit holes for research. <laughs> but, I bet you did. And last but definitely not least, um, Radcliffe, tell us what you got going on. <laughs> um, here we go. Let's see. There you go. There's the cover. Oh, looks backwards to me. Love on the Night Shift. That is coming out May 1st. And it's number six in the River series. So it is a continuation of a story of a small rural upstate New York community, but it's a standalone in that there are two brand new characters introduced in this one, along with some of the familiar characters from the previous books. So it's a new romance between, we're all writing nurses, it seems, an ER nurse and a young surgery attendant who is new to the area. Um, and the issues that they face with a past that they're unaware of that becomes uh, more clear as the story progresses. And it delves into a little bit of the characters from the previous books, particularly Blake, who is a young trans teen, and his friend Margie, who is the sister of uh, the central family that is featured in the entire series. So that will be out May 1st. Very popular series, love it. Um, Aaron, why don't you take us on our first question? I'm going to ask you, what inspired you to write about um, first responders? You've got a paramedic coming up in the, I'm kind of focusing on the medical here. So what inspired you to write about these folks? Um, well, uh, I've spent 20 years in the 911 system, so I have a lot of um, easy research, really. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's exciting every day. Um, these particular characters, the uh, the characters in the first story kind of came to me first, and um, the idea to make it a three sort of novella collection instead of a, a full length book, um, it, I thought it'd be interesting to be able to tell three distinct stories uh, focusing on each couple, but then being able to tie them together uh, through some of the events in the book, and you, there's a little bit of overlap, and so I was able to kind of, um, it's just a different challenge really. That's fun. I like I like when you get some crossover there. Um, Renee, how about you? You you work in a hospital setting, yes? I do. <clears throat> and um, this story, all of my stories really start with the main characters, and I figure out what their names are going to be, and then uh, what they look like, and from there, I try to fit professions that are different, but plausible in the fact that their um, lives will cross in some way. And um, I knew Blaze would drive a motorcycle, and I knew that there's always the danger of an accident. Um, and what perfect way for someone, whether professional or not, to meet someone who sparks some kind of an interest a personal interest. Um, that's how I came up with Trinity being the ER nurse um, that attends to Blaze. Um, and there's a note of familiarity that comes out in the book. You must buy the book to know. <laughs> <laughs> So Emily, you you definitely work in a hospital setting too. I'm sure that might have inspired you. 
Yeah. Um, I, you know, I mean, medicine is definitely kind of what I know in the sense that I've been working in the field for a while. Um, and I, I have always sort of really enjoyed writing about it. Um, and it's sort of, in a way, it's easier for me to detach myself from my, my other work in the hospital um, while I'm writing. Um, but I also get to take a lot of experience direct experience from it and some of the I think best feedback that I get on my work is that it feels very authentic um, because a lot of the stuff that I take is things that either I've experienced or my colleagues have experienced um, and you know right now being in the ER it's it's um, it, it definitely gives a lot of material for sure um, it does on a regular basis but especially at this point in time um, and it was also this particular story, it was really important for me. Um, actually, it was, this was rad inspired this back with, you know, introducing Glenn as having a PA in a book, which was like, there, there aren't very many of us in the media and in, in like represented and at least not represented correctly. So I felt like m my personal feelings aside, like I wanted to show what we do. And um, I felt like obligated to the profession to sort of make a character that was a PA, why not, you know, and to show what our job is. And at the same time as, um, you know, obviously making them a character in, in, this, in, in a romance. So that was fun for me to do. Brad, I'm gonna jump to you now since um, you practice medicine for a number of years. Um, so I have kind of two questions. Too many to count. One, <laughs> um, so I assume that inspires your <laughs> desire to, to write about medical profession, but also as, as you become removed from it, does it get harder or, or do you still have plenty of material to draw from? Do you keep up well, with you know, a lot of that? Um, I do out of interest things that I read. It's interesting. I was writing for 25 years before I wrote a medical romance, which was Passion's Right Fury. Partly because I was still practicing medicine during all that time. And I wanted to write about things that I wasn't rather than things that I was. And I was really surprised how much I actually enjoyed writing the first one. And I go back to it pretty frequently now for a number of reasons. One is practical. People seem to enjoy medical romances. So as a published author, I try to write what I hope people will enjoy reading. I like writing about them. It feels comfortable to me. I mean, one thing I don't have to think about is setting. I mean, I know it so intrinsically that it's easy for me to write the experience of being in the midst. Um, so that's, that makes it a little bit easier. I don't, I feel pretty comfortable. I mean, when I write specifics, like for patient or character in the book has a particular illness, I will generally read about it now to make sure that there aren't tests that I wouldn't have done when I was still practicing so that I can be sure, as Emily said, it still feels authentic, although it's probably only going to feel authentic to the people in medicine who read it. Most people aren't really going to know the difference. So I do research when I'm writing, you know, various illnesses, but in general, it still feels like yesterday to me. Riding a bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Erin McKenzie, um, yeah. so you've written not just a medical um, themed book, but also historical. So I imagine that that was whole next level of, <laughs> of <Yeah>. research. <laughs> and so what, is, what inspired you to pick on both those challenges? Well, I, I've always loved history and I love historical novels. So I figured on my third one, I had my feet wet enough to try it. And, um, you know, I grew up watching MASH and may or may not have had a little thing for Dana Delaney in China Beach and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And it just lends itself to a lot of really good storytelling, the medical side of war, uh, medical side of history. And when I started thinking about it, I was initially going to do something maybe in World War II, um, but World War II has been done so much and Vietnam's been done so much. And I realized that there was very little out there about World War I. So I went digging and um, it was fascinating uh, what those folks went through and the nurses especially. And I just needed to 
the story just came to me and the characters just came to me and I really, really wanted to honor them because they've been forgotten largely and they did so much, um, so much amazing work. So that's why I went down that road. So I'm going to stop here and take an audience question. We've got one. Um, do any of you plan to include a COVID type scenario in a future medical story? Um, somebody may have already done that. <laughs> I'll field this one. Okay. Uh, I actually, back in the last fall before anybody had ever heard of COVID, myself included, decided that my next manuscript was going to be about a pandemic uh, where a uh, CDC doctor and a medicine uh, infectious disease doctor who knew each other back in medical school reunite uh, on the front lines of a flu-like pandemic and fall in love again. Uh, so that was started and then this happened. Um, so that's been really interesting. So yes, I accidentally went down that path. Is it art imitating life or the I, other way around? You know, I would feel really bad if it was life imitating art. We'll put it like that. Um, I've got one. I just uh, decided that the book I'm going to start May 1st is going, which is, and I'm not changing this, is the, I think, 10th in the Provincetown Tales. But I've been impressed every time I've been to Provincetown at the huge cruise ships that have been in the harbor that I've never seen before. And I kept thinking about it, and I kept thinking about the fact that this is not like New York City and all the big cities where a lot of um, this started with airplanes coming in. So um, I'm actually going to use that as a setting for the next book, and it's going to be part of the story. Awesome. Treacherous Seas is the name of the book. Treacherous Seas, I like that. Anyone else? I have a quick mention um, of a new work that I'm 10,000 into and um, waiting to hear on, fingers crossed. And uh, she's driving through rural upstate New York and stops at, um, the character's name is Lee, and she stops uh, beside a, a lake, one of the, the lakes, and uh, to have lunch, and she thinks, this area would be wonderful if there was a, um, a pandemic. And it's just kind of a mention without going into it, um, because that's the setting that I'm writing under, and, uh, I felt like I had to kind of include it. New York is a unique state and people don't realize, a lot of them don't realize that there's a lot more to New York than the city. <laughs> Preach, sister. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a mention, but I'm not going to write about a pandemic. Any other takers? Oh, so, Aaron's thinking. Yeah. I, honestly, I don't know at this point. I'm just trying to get through it and then reassess how I feel about everything because I'm not sure that it's going to be an, uh, a set of emotions that I want to revisit that often. Agreed. It's definitely yeah, halted my sense. writing on that's for sure. Yeah, I keep yeah, seeing so how everybody's talking about their word counts and everything, and it's actually kind of stalled my creativity. I, it's weird. I haven't been able to write at all. So I think during, especially times like these, um, we view medical professionals and first responders as kind of hero figures. Um, i like you all to talk about how having a character ha cast in the role of hero um, affects the romance. Um, you know, if you have one character who's very heroic, how do you pick the character that goes with them? How does that affect their relationships? Um, just kind of a general discussion about that. And um, Emily, I'm going to toss that off to you first. Um, huh, yeah, this is a tough one. I, I thought about it um, because I, I think both of my characters often tend to be in the medical field. Um, so there is not that sort of, you know, one is the, seen as the hero and one might not be. Um, they're both 
sometimes often and I would say in similar professions. Um, so yeah, I mean, but I, I think it, I try to, I think it's important to try to keep a realistic ish spin on things and not make these characters larger than life because maybe because I work in healthcare and I know a lot of, you know, most of the people in my life do. And so to me, it's like, it's not necessarily heroic. It's just sort of your job and you do it. Um, so I really try to like keep that as perspective to not make the characters too big. Um, but I don't really have that dynamic. I think in most cases of one is sort of seen as this hero and the other one may not be because of what they do or don't do for work. Erin McKenzie, how about you? I mean, you've got these nurses during wartime. Yeah, they, they don't see themselves as heroic at all. Um, but I, I think they're in the middle of it and, and it, you know, they were thrown in and overwhelmed so quickly that they just are doing, just trying to get through minute by minute and not seeing themselves as heroes at all. Um, and in fact, you know, I think that they almost feel like they can't do enough. In my story, at least. Ram? You, well, you talk, you've written a lot and talked about heroes, so I... Yeah, I'm big on heroes. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I always write heroes. But I, I think that we're talking about apples and oranges a tiny bit when we're the literary hero has not necessarily larger than life characteristics, but characteristics that I think make really great central characters. I like writing characters. I think one of the most important aspects of a hero is nobility. Um, the other is humility. I mean, these are some of the characteristics of the epic hero if you look at literature throughout the ages. So I think that that allows us to create multidimensional characters that no matter what they're doing, whether they're cops or doctors or librarians or so, they're struggling with something and it's how they struggle that makes them heroic in, in my mind. So I think that if we think of heroes in that way, we're probably all writing heroes. And I think that the classic hero that we're talking about here, the doctors and the cops and, and the people that say all the first responders and everybody, not even everybody that puts themselves on the line for someone else or the betterment of their world, they're heroes. I think that it's a great way to build conflict into your story, especially if you're writing a character like a Secret Service agent, as I did in the Honor series, who is willing to die for someone else. That makes it kind of hard for the person who wants them to be around. So I think that that allows you to put, create conflict that's a true conflict because you admire that person, but you wish they weren't doing it. So I think that it, it gives you a lot to work with. If you think about heroism, it's more as not being bigger than life, being a real person, but a real person who's willing to sacrifice for something or someone. Really good point. Anyone else want to add to that? It's like, no, I don't want to follow Rad. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll be brave. <laughs> A hero. Um, I think that, you know, we all want validation in knowing that what we do matters to others. Uh, and it's not always seen that way. And I think that that's part of the um, gift of being a writer is that you can make every character be a hero or heroine. Um, because of what they do and how they affect another person's life. And it doesn't have to be running into a burning building. It can just be as simple as making that other person feel like they matter. Mm -hmm. Good point. Erin Dutton, you want the last word? No. <laughs> no. I mean, I think they, they covered it, um, you know, when I started, when I started working at 911 and, and you tell people that you, you know, answer 911 calls, the first thing they ask is, oh, you must, you must hear a lot of crazy stuff. And honestly, you almost feel put on the spot to come up with a story for them. And I don't have a lot of them because you answer so many calls and the same thing, I assume, in other professions. I mean, you do this so many times and you've trained for it and it, it, 
like Emily said, it's the job and it all kind of becomes just part of the day. Um, I mean, honestly, there are a few that stick with you, but to be able to come up with all these crazy stories, it just doesn't happen. It's, it's part of the job. So I think that, you know, first responders, they don't, most that I know, they don't, they wouldn't say they were heroes. They're say they would say they're doing the job. Makes sense. That, that part of what makes them heroes, I think. Um, so we've got a few other audience questions here. Um, how many of your own personal experiences color the stories you write? Um, you all have all kind of touched on that. Does anyone want to dip back in to give a personal anecdote or something fun? <laughs> I would say what Emily said, in, in terms of the medical cases that I put in my books, they, I've done them all. I've been part of them all. They're all real. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't want anyone to be recognized, and I doubt that they would be. But if I'm talking about someone who comes into the emergency room with a gunshot wound, it's because I've been there um, and the surgeries I've done. And I, I think that, well, for me, it's fun to write them, but I think it really helps if you've actually done it. Because if you read books where people haven't done it, it's obvious. So it's one, of, and it's just like anything else. If I were to write a lawyer, oh boy, that would probably not be great. <laughs> because I wouldn't know how to do it with authenticity. So, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I can say my uh, first two books were definitely write what you know kind of thing. Um, you know, one was about a school counselor. I'm a school counselor. The second one was about adoption. And my wife and I adopted our kids. So I felt like I, you know had some street cred there. Um, this third one was a total departure and I'm not a nurse and never have been and now Rad makes me feel like it's gonna suck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> but hopefully not. <laughs> but um, Nick, how many surgeries yeah, so, did you write in? <laughs> I didn't write in any surgeries. It was a lot of just uh, research. I did my research. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> All right, well, we've got another audience question here. Um, have any of you written something with wilderness medicine where someone's out away from a city or town? Would you, have you or would you? Rad, I feel like you must have. Well, I've written Firestorm, which is a first responder and they're smoke jumpers. So I think that probably would fit because they're, they're obviously trained it's not really wilderness medicine exactly, but it's certainly taking place in the wilderness under extreme conditions. So I, I would say yes, although we're not talking about the kind of things where you might find if someone's been lost in the mountains for you know, two weeks or something like that. It was very specific to these acute situations. I actually wrote a scene, well, like a chapter in uh, my, my third book uh, after the fire where they go on a uh, the, the firefighter and a, a paramedic go on a wilderness uh, medicine retreat um, and there's a big flood and their trail gets washed out and they're stranded and and uh, I know nothing about wilderness medicine I'm, I'm a city person um, so that was really hard to write and I completely made it up like a hundred percent it was one of those like write just enough so it sounds like you know what you're talking about. I had no idea, but it was fun because um, I, I didn't know at all about camping or uh, being outdoors. No, I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other faux campers? <laughs> well, I've never jumped out of an airplane into a burning forest either. But in terms of research, as Erin was noting about her research in World War I, I mean, if you don't know or you haven't done personally what you're writing about, there's lots of ways to find, you know, pretty true life experiences. I read blogs of smoke jumpers so I could figure out what they did and get the lingo. And that helped a lot. Yeah, that makes I, sense. I, I found books of uh, letters, first, first person letters from actual mm -hmm. World War I nurses and really drew from their experiences. Yeah, that's great. I got Emily to help me with a scene <laughs> in, in Bonded Love. Um, I was like, 
listen, I don't know if this is right. <laughs> I have no clue. Can you help me? <laughs> Would this happen? <laughs> and I'm she so did. Sure. <laughs> I asked. So, oh, God. Oh, go no, on, no, go. It came out great. Thank uh, you. Good, good. I'm glad. Um, I, I ask coworkers a lot, like um, this current story that I was working on that haven't touched for a month um, about the, the pandemic. Um, I, I've never done any sort of like medical missions or relief work or anything. And so this is sort of set up with like a Doctors Without Borders feel where they're they're in like uh, rural Louisiana. Um, and, you know, it's a there's tents and there is everything and, and it's at the bio. I've never been to Louisiana. Um, so I have a bunch of colleagues that have done sort of med medical mission trips and things because I don't really know how that how those things operate because I've never done it before. Um, so it's helped to sort of talk to them about like the the operational stuff and who's in charge and and I watch a lot of movies too, you know, with similar <laughs> similar settings. So um, whether whether or not that's accurate, but you could figure it's at least some some piece of uh, piece of the puzzle. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to research and um, a lot of it can be done kind of on the fly online or, or whatnot. I'm just kind of digging into various sources. But like Emily said, I, I, I try to talk to somebody when I can. When I was writing Landing Zone, it's about a um, police helicopter pilot. And um, we, it was actually inspired um, by hearing some radio traffic of um, Nashville happens to have a female police helicopter pilot. And so um, kind of got in touch with her through some contacts and actually got to go and spend the day at the hangar with her just kind of um, going over the helicopter and asking questions and a lot of the background of that, that character was built from um, you know sort of her career path through the military um, and and she we kept in touch while I was writing and she was available for questions and things like that so it's always a good resource to get someone who has been there makes perfect sense mm -hmm. So here's a question. Um, how do you strike a balance between adding medical detail to your manuscript and keeping the pacing brisk? And, I, I, yeah. Well, I'll jump in. Um, I think that it's easy for all of us to write what we're really familiar with, whether it's a lawyer writing law or a doctor or a medical person or a you know, first responder writing those scenes, those tend to be kind of comfortable scenes. And I think like anything else, you have to make each scene say something about the character, usually. So even though the scene is fun and it gives you the, the meat of the, the setting, it has to really be about what happens to the character during that scene. And I think if you can do that, then you can keep your pace moving forward because you're developing character and story in these vignettes, they shouldn't exist outside. It's just like a sex scene. If it doesn't have something else to say about the character and or the story, then you should probably trim it way back. That's how I look at those scenes when I put them in a romance. Makes sense. Anyone else? I kind of look at it like, a, you know, when you're writing about a place to, you know, the difference between making it like a travel log and just hitting the highlights um, to give give flavor. I think I, I think it's tough to to decide how much technical detail, especially medical detail, to put in. But I have to say that after watching Grey's Anatomy, which was a real eye opener for me, when I I, I came to the party like twelve years too late, and I <laughs> so I binge watched for like six months, and I watched them all. And the, the beginning ones were amazingly detailed and, and accurate in terms of the experience. And it was tons of surgery. And I thought, well, if people like watching that, then hopefully they'll like reading about it. And I try to make the scenes accessible, but especially um, in Passionate Rivals, which I wrote most recently, it was, there were a fair number of medical scenes and I hope that they went over okay. But Grey's Anatomy was like, sort of like, well, if people like that, they'll like this maybe. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Rad. That's exactly what I thought too when I was trying to um, figure out the balance between authenticity and like you want people to feel engulfed in that world of medicine, but also not wanting to be talking over people and talking shop. Um, and I noticed too, exactly from Grey's Anatomy, that they're very, very detailed and they're not using layman's terms to describe things. So I made the decision in my work as well to err on the side of medical ease and let the reader sort of 
get absorbed into that world and not necessarily understand every single you know detail of every procedure, but understand the the the, the general feel of what's happening. Um, and I think it just get, gives it a more authentic feel to it than than you know like describing uh, uh, oh they have bleeding in the brain as opposed to saying oh it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I just think it gives it more a realistic flavor that people seem to appreciate. I think that's a really good point. I didn't stay in the hospital scene that long because uh, that's not, I don't know that much about medicine. I mean, I know the environment. I know I worked in pediatric oncology for 11 years in administration. I know the angst um, that professionals feel when they treat patients that may or may not recover. Um, I've, I've watched it. So I wrote that in, but I didn't write in specific medical procedures or, or um, treatments because that's, that wasn't what I knew. But I tried to instill the feeling that professionals have when they're faced with death and dying and 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 recovery and and being feeling good about those patients that they helped too so someone has asked how do you strike a balance uh, oh i'm sorry i when you write a character with an illness or disability is it harder to make them relatable for the reader I don't think it's I don't think it's harder. Um, in my first book, um, I wrote about a character who had MS, and um, actually during the stories when she was diagnosed, so it was kind of that emotional range of getting the diagnosis and then dealing with it. I I, I think it. I mean, I hope it it makes the character more real and um, it gives you an opportunity to kind of bring out some of those flaws and insecurities. So, um, and, and everybody has, everybody struggles with something, um, whether it's a physical ailment or, you know, something external or internal in life. Everyone, everyone knows struggle. And so I think writing struggle is kind of a universal thing. Erin, Mackenzie, do you want to <laughs> tag on that? You look like you were about to say something. I'm just nodding in agreement with everybody. <laughs> I, I agree with Erin. I mean, I think if you're going to write a character who is different in some way, differently abled or has a chronic illness or whatever the case may be, there has to be a purpose for creating the character in that way. Um, just like every other attribute we give to a character, there should be a purpose that they have that attribute. When I wrote Love's Melody Lost, Graham is blind. That's central to the story. I mean, if she weren't blind, I couldn't have written that story. It would have been a different story. So I don't think it makes the characters more difficult to relate to if you use that as a building block of their character, of their conflict, of their, I mean, it, I think it needs to be part of the person. And then there's more to them than just that attribute. I think that's what I'm trying to say. It needs to be key, but they need to be well-developed in every other way too. I, I would I would add Carson that um just like any any of us writing something other than we are mm -hmm. um, different race or different abilities or different whatever you just have to be very very careful um, that you're authentic and representing people in in a in a respectful way that makes perfect sense so. Someone has asked, um, got a lot of questions here. Um, why do you think lesbian romance novels centered around characters working in the medical field are so popular? Hmm. And I, I think some of you have touched on that, the, but does anyone want to answer that? Women in uniform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of action. Lots of action. I think that, that that's one of the appealing things. Excitement, action, danger, uncertainty. Um, I mean, those are elements that always work no matter what you're writing, I think. But that's, that's part of it. 
sex in on call rooms. That's always good. <laughs> <laughs> I think the idea of that. medicine too is very sexy. Um, the reality is not, but the like, the, the fictionalized version of medicine is very sexy, which makes it easy to write. Um, I think it makes it easy to, to incorporate romance into that. I don't know, Emily. I spelled, I spent 30 years doing it and I thought it was pretty sexy. Thought it was sexy? Well, we must have different experiences, right? Because <laughs> you were a surgeon. <laughs> So, um, so we have a, a kind of writing related. What is um, your writing schedule like? You write, do you write on a schedule? Do you write when you can? Um, I am. Why don't you tackle this first? Oh. Is it me? Yes. Oh, scared me there for a minute. Um, I um, actually adopted um, Aurora's schedule and I'm now writing. 45 minutes, depending on how quickly I get out of bed or an hour um, in the morning. And um, I usually read at lunch at work. And then I write again anywhere from one to four hours at night, depending on my evening. And I can marathon right on the weekend. It depends. Um, I just started writing something on the seventh and I'm at 10,000 words, um, which is pretty impressive for me. Um, I'm, I'm usually a fits and starts kind of gal that, you know, I, I get a bunch written and then it's like crap. <laughs> and I stall for a, a couple of days or maybe a week. Um, and in that time I write um, usually a short story just to keep writing every day. Erin Dutton, do you write every day? Um, I don't write every day. And I think um, my, my process is my commute home is my brainstorming time. For some reason, that's when I can kind of um, let go of whatever's happened at work and, and think about the story and where I want it to go. And then so usually it's when I first get home from work about an hour or however long I need to get that, that whatever came to me during that drive worked out. Um, but since I'm not commuting as much right now, um, it's kind of been interrupted. Um, so, and it, it depends on where I am in the book too, kind of like Renee said, um, obviously the closer I get to my deadline, the more time there seems to be to write. Um, it, it's, I, I tend to be more of a pressure writer, I think. So um, I just want to take a quick second interruption here to announce a flash sale. <laughs> We're having a 20% off sale on medical romances, a couple of first responder titles in there as well. The coupon code is DOCTOR, D-O-C-T-O-R, um, all caps, and we're about to post a link in the chat roll. So that sale will be good from now until an hour after this panel is over. So while you're while they're answering questions, you can be buying their books. Um, yes, <laughs> and um, so that they can eat dinner things. <laughs> um, and, and kind of piggybacking off this question y'all were just answering, someone has asked, I think it's amazing that any of you can write right now. My focus is shot to hell. How are you coping up with keeping up with your writing? Um, so just kind of piggybacking on the question we were talking about, about writing schedules, how has the current climate affected that? Terribly. <laughs> um, you know, I think we all deal with stress differently. And I think that, I don't think there's any, you know, right, wrong, good, bad answer to how we experience this. I personally am do best if I work. Um, and I haven't changed my work habits at all. Um, fortunately, we, this business, we can run pretty much exactly as we always have. So we do, and it's, we're really busy. I mean, putting on this event is something that, you know, you, Sandy, you, you and Sandy mostly did after a brainstorm probably two and a half weeks ago. Um, so personally, I do what I've always done. I get up in the morning. I 
when I plan a book, I schedule 10 weeks to write 75,000 words. Um, I give myself a little extra time, but I know my word count. I write to that word count every week and I don't vary. And I've been doing it, you know, for a, for a long time and I'm still doing it. And that for me, the more I can keep my life the way it's always been, even though it's a pain in the butt that I actually can't, um, the less crazy it makes me. So I, I try to work the way I've always worked every day. Erin McKenzie? Yeah, um, I, I just put a post up on Facebook not too long ago, basically like, is anybody else having a really hard time writing <laughs> right now? And, and a lot of people chimed in that they were. Um, I mean, normally I, I write in fits and starts. I, I have three kids and, you know, work, work full time and everything. And I just, I just don't write daily. Um, I write in, in batches, but um, yeah, it's been really difficult to focus for me right now. You know what I have found? I can't read as much. I can't seem to get lost in other, in a book. Um, unless it's like one of my ultimate most favorite authors ever. And that's like, feels very strange, but I just can't disconnect enough from everything that's going on. But when I write, I always disconnect. When I'm writing, there's never any outside world. But reading is a little bit harder for me to get into. Emily, how about you? You're, uh, right, you're right in the thick of it here. Yeah. My, my schedule has gone to hell. Um, it's, it's more of a matter, I, I have not been writing much at all. Um, I've been doing what I can to keep up with proofs and stuff for the work that's coming out, but it's been a little while, pretty much since this whole thing started, um, primarily because the stress and anxiety at work right now is so heightened. Um, and I, I'm starting to think it may help me to try to sit down and, and write, but especially given what I had already started writing about, I've been afraid to go back to it. And the reason for that is because one, I don't want too much of this, my day-to-day -day life to seep into that story. I want this to be a, a romance and not a horrific story about a pandemic, but that's what we're living right now. So I'm afraid that that will happen. And also it's, it's, my life right now is, you know, go to work. It's, it's sick people. It's, it's COVID. And it's hard to go back and sit at the computer and write pandemic. Uh, but I also don't want to necessarily start something else. So I've, I've made the decision in the last week that I'm going to try to go back and uh, see what comes out while being very conscious of the fact that this is, I'm not writing a, a, a you know, a, biographical story about this pandemic and trying to keep my real life out of it, um, which I think is going to be a challenge, but it, it could also be good, good for the story and good for me mentally. Makes sense. Erin Dutton. Um, yeah, I, I really haven't been writing too much. Um, it's when all of this happened, we were still in the office every day. Um, and as, as things progress, we've kind of gone to this hybrid work environment where I'm at home most days and then a couple of times a week, I've got to go in and do things that need to be done in the office that we physically have to do. Um, so not a lot of writing, but lots of these teleconferences and, and meetings and things. And it, so I, I do have a question for the other panelists because I've been on a few of these and every time I kind of wonder um, how many of us actually have pants on <laughs> not about it but i, I do <laughs> yeah and i have three children running around the house so as opposed to pajamas <laughs> yeah I, well yeah i mean i i pajama pants and my shirt right <laughs> so i just want to shout out to to all of you um that we've had some comments the bsb authors are literally the best in the world um, we need lovely lesbic like this thank you thank um, you yeah, thank you. Appreciate your gift of storytelling, especially now when we all need an escape. Um, so I appreciate y'all being here, taking time from your lives to do this. And we appreciate all the readers and, and people who've tuned in to watch. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, the next session that's coming up is Chemistry 101. It'll be at four o'clock. Um, the registration link is on the boldstrokes.com backslash bookathon a site if you're not already registered. Um, make sure you visit the flash sale. 
Uh, it's good for another hour. And um, thanks to all of our panelists. I appreciate y'all being here today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for organizing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Stay safe. Be well. Oh, 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 oh,